Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and uh, once again, it's a great pleasure to join you this evening. You and I, all of us can sit back and hear the story of how the Holy Spirit has awakened, in this case, a, a fallen away Catholic, uh, back to discover his roots. And in this process, not only are we gonna hear a little bit about something called Anglo-Catholicism, but we're gonna hear something about the ordinary, I think, depending on how much we get into this program. Our guest is Kevin McDermott. And Kevin, wonderful to have you on the journey I'm home. so glad to be here, Marcus. And uh, before we get into my weird little tale, <laughs> uh, if you'll permit me, I'd like to say something, which is as a birth Catholic, um, until I ended up working in this odd little vineyard, part of the vineyard called the Ordinariate, I had never heard of the journey home. But it didn't take long, and that's five years ago when the American Ordinariate was erected, that I began to hear of it. And um, as I began to do this work and began to meet the people that were coming into the church or had already come into the church, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what our separated brethren knew, believed in, that sort of thing, but it didn't take long to discover that I didn't actually. Mm -hmm. There was much under the rubric of, well, all Christians believe that, don't they? <laughs> and I quickly <laughs> discovered, no, they didn't. Yeah. So having heard of the journey home, I figured I had better actually do some homework and sort of discover who these people are that are coming into the church and what actually they did believe. So I began to watch it and it was both of great practical use to me in picking up yeah. some of that knowledge, but even more importantly, it was of great spiritual value to me. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm humbled to find myself sitting in this wow. chair because there are so many, so various tales of the, the journeys people have taken to the fullness of the faith and many of them such tales of heroic virtue that, you know, I'm frequently in, in tears when I watch this program. So the first thing I want to say is just thank you. Thank you and everyone who's involved in this apostolate because it has borne so much fruit for the advancement of the kingdom. And I can't speak highly enough about it. And I'm still rather flabbergasted <laughs> that I'm here. And I don't know what my weird little tale can well, add to that, but we'll find out. It's good to have you here, Kevin. Thank you for the kind words. Of course, you're extending those kind words to Mother Angelica. You know, God rest her soul. Uh, it was her idea, but it's been a great privilege these 20 years. And of course, I always, I always have to make the correction, not correction, but the clarification between the Journey Home Program, which is the EWTN's opportunity for us to hear the stories of men and women who come back to the church. And then we got the Coming, coming Home Network was a bit yeah. separate in which we stand beside men and women who are trying to make that decision. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me get out of the way. And, All right. Uh, Kevin, let me invite you to start us off on the journey. I will certainly do that. And uh, in retailing this odd story, <laughs> which puzzled me at the time, it still puzzles me looking back. It caused a lot of cold sweat and the effusion of not a little red Frank blood <laughs> along the way. <laughs> Um, I frankly wouldn't define myself as a fallen away Catholic. To me, on the inside, it seemed like I started a faithful Catholic and by the grace of God alone, I ended one. I could never have predicted the path my life would take. It seemed like the Holy Spirit was with me all the way, but I neither defend nor commend my path. I merely say <laughs> this was my experience, my story, and okay. here it is. I was born in 1953, so I remember the Preconciliar Church fairly well. It's the church in which I received my first Holy Communion, in which I received my earliest formation. But the greatest blessings of God, and He's showered me with them all through my life, were two. Uh, one that I've never felt, I've always had a very intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, I've never, I could walk out of here and into a dark night of the soul, but so far, God hasn't given that to me. Uh, and the second, which is a blessing that I feel more and more deeply every day that I live, were two wonderful, wonderful parents, God rest their souls, both of whom not only loved their Catholic faith, mm. but they knew it. And I was formed as a Catholic in the domestic church, the way the church actually wishes her children to be formed. So, uh, so the first 12 years of your Catholic upbringing were in the Latin church. Yes. The pre-Vatican II exactly. experience. And, and as a result of that, what you're saying is that indeed you had found our Lord Jesus Christ and had experienced the, the intimacy. By the grace of God, yeah. by the grace of God and the, 
the good workings of my parents. Yeah. Um, both my parents were the products of parochial education. They both swore on a stack of Douay Bibles <laughs> that I would not be, not because they found anything wrong with it, but they felt, for better or for worse, that based on what they had experienced in the 1920s and 30s, that it didn't prepare you for life in the larger world. So mm -hmm. I experienced religious education. I went to a public school, did religious education. And until the abuses which began to pile up after Vatican II, but which had very little to do with Vatican II, yeah. um, I received excellent formation in religious ed from both clergy, uh, religious, and laity. My mother herself taught religious ed. But things began to go wonky yeah. after that. And so you remember when the when the change by change by change was I am down old enough local. to have caught the poltergeist of Vatican II, yeah. which really had more to do with the spirit of the 60s than it ever had to do with Vatican II. I read the documents of Vatican II when they were being published. I don't know how many laity did at that time, right. particularly ones who were in their teens, yeah. but I did. And while there might be the odd thing that I might scruple with, you know, this is the Catholic Church. They don't have to ask Kevin McDermott, and it's not Kevin McDermott's <laughs> job. You know, that's the Holy Spirit's job. And if there is anything that's not quite right, the Holy Spirit will take care of it in his own good time, you know. But in general, I thought them then excellent, and I still do. But what we saw, I can only speak about what I saw in the Northeast of the United States, had very little to do with those documents. And the first major problem, and the thing that I thought long and hard about whether I would actually say this, because I certainly have no wish to give scandal, but because this is sort of what kicks off yeah. the, the weirdness, um, I'll go ahead. And in saying it, I wish to say, if anyone out there, a birth Catholic, was hurt by something like this, and it hurt them enough that they left the church, and maybe they're still outside of the church, come back. The church is the spotless bride of Christ. And then there's the bark of Peter, which is full of sinners, of which I am the first. <laughs> and you know, it always will be, you know, yeah. but that's the church is really the spotless bride of Christ. And Jesus Christ is waiting there with all the mercy in the world. Come back, come back. At any rate, a bright sunny June day in 1967 or 68, I think 68, my father, God rest his soul, was standing on the steps of our parish church in Austin, New York, and relating to the curate of the parish that he was not too happy with some of the things that were happening. And I wish I could say it was only this one ill-advised priest, looked him right in the eye and put his hand on my 15-year-old shoulder right over there and said, Ray, we don't really care what you think. We have the hearts of the youth. We're just waiting for you to die. And it was at that point that I made a very rash vow. Hey, I was only 15. And I thought then, and I still say now with 2020 hindsight, hey, how long could it be? <laughs> well, that rash vow was all right until I find a parish where the Catholic faith as I know it to be, actually to be, is taught and practiced. I am not going to mass. I will keep my faith in pectore. I will do my devotions and I will wait because this is the Catholic church. The Holy Spirit gave those beautiful promises to Peter as he handed him the keys. The Holy Spirit will never leave it. The gates of hell will not prevail. Hey, you know, it's got to come around. This this yeah. can't be everywhere. Well, yes. I was going to say I'm, that, that comment by that, that unfortunate comment by that priest, and you said a couple other priests were affirming that same attitude. It was all over, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering if that was would you say that part of that came from there was before the 60s rarely that laity would question the local priest on anything they would accept it 
And so when you see the changes as a result of, and not as a result of, but happening at the same time, it's hard to know which are of the council and which ain't of the council, because they're all happening like a garment, happening at the same time. And so now all of a sudden you've got a lot of laity saying, wait, 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 Father, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And so some of them just said, just point. stay out of my face. Yeah. You know, this I, happened to be a younger priest. You know, he was not the PP. Um, but all of the all of the abuses that piled up then had much more to do with the spirit of the 60s. Yeah. It was another one of these year zero times when everything that was old was bad and yeah. the youth were going to be our saviors and everything that was new was great. And yeah. when the church decided to open the windows in the late 40s and blow the dust off, it seemed like a great idea. And of course, the Holy Spirit is over all of this. Okay. What happened, happened. But by the time the church really did open the windows, everything was going crazy outside and much of that seeped in. We all have seen the, the results. Yeah. But at any rate, um, that... So you kept it inside at least, but then you're just... Some people just ran screaming away from the church. Others went to the Eastern Catholic rites. I would not become a schismatic. God's grace preserved me from anger. The 12 most important words my father was both my voice teacher it, anything that you see good in me comes from my parents and of course God who gave them and everything else to me but the 12 most important words my father ever said to me were and he was speaking specifically of the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> was you can't knock a great idea for the way it's carried out and I'll tell you those 12 <laughs> words have saved me from a lot of grief and a lot of anger it's allowed me to forgive myself, forgive a lot of people, help me out of a lot of very difficult circumstances because you may have noticed this is a fallen creation. Yeah. At any our, rate. I was gonna say our guest, our guest is Kevin McDermott, along with that statement that your dad made, and woe, woe on me if I'm the cause, woe on me if I'm the one that messes up this wonderful gift that God given us, this church. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, well, I don't want to be the cause of anyone else to be brought down with you. So when you're in a time of all this change, it's hard to know sometimes whether you're with it or not, or whether you're part of the problem or trying to make a correction. My choice, and as I say, I don't commend it to anyone else. I would never urge anyone to follow the path I did, mm -hmm. but I was always constantly in touch with the Holy Spirit all the way through this weird thing. I never felt anything but wholesomeness about it. I never felt the touch of evil, but I would never say to anyone else, follow what I did. Mm. Keep in touch with the Holy Spirit and do what you're told to do. Was, I wouldn't go schismatic. I, wouldn't, I didn't feel like I was called to the Eastern Church. I was a child of the West. That was my tradition. But I couldn't go to the clown masses. I was in no fit state to receive communion. I knew about the doctrine of the communion of desire. And then I began to get really interested in the experiences of the recusants, if that word means tell, anything. Yeah, tell the audience what that. The faithful Catholics, my favorite, my favorite saint, like every child, male child of my generation, I hope it's still the case, when I got with whom their Catholic faith was an important part of their life, and fortunately it always has been for me, when I got to be 9, 11, that sort of period, I made, I sought a vocation, see whether God wanted that for me. And I got a very quick answer and a very clear one, which was, no, you're not to be a priest. There was a second half to it, which we'll see what happens with that. But, but you might end your days in a monastery. I don't know what's going to happen with that one. So yeah, it was also the time we were preparing to be confirmed. And uh, my favorite saint has always been St. Thomas More, not because of the Englishness, but because as a layman, he participated in every facet of life at the absolute top perfection of it. He was an intellectual. He loved music. He loved the arts. He had a broad base of friends. He was a family man. He did everything. But his faith was at the center of it all. His mm -hmm. Catholic faith was at the center of it all. And when push came to shove, God and his church first. And he gave his life for it. Funny how God works with the way things worked out for me. So at any rate, um, we now come to this, this point, and I began to look, I was always interested in music as my trade, and um, I was always in, if it's not music, it's history. So I was always interested in early music, which was a coming thing at that point. 
I was particularly drawn to the music of the early Renaissance of the northern countries, particularly England, because the Renaissance got to the north very late. And in Germany, in England, you have this glorious blossoming, but it's neither the one thing or the other. There's this hardness of the late Middle Ages with this blossoming of the Renaissance. It's a fascinating period. Is that Pachelbel's time? No, no, this is centuries before that. We're talking oh, about okay. the 1520s, okay, 1530s. The gotcha. uh, reason I mention that, because some of the audience may be familiar with that. Every wedding, there's, um, I'm wondering if they're, they're trying to get their mind, exactly what you're talking about. This is the period of Henry VIII. Yeah, and okay. Henry VIII, there was money coming into England because of the, the new sheep, the wool trade. And he wanted to like put the jet skis on and make England into a Renaissance place. So. Okay. You have this beautiful late blossoming of Catholicism in England with music. Thomas More was part of that. Erasmus was part of that. Read the stripping of the altars if you want to see how, yeah. how beautiful it was before it all came a cropper. So when it did come a cropper, those faithful Catholics who would not sign the paper that said Henry VIII is the head of the English church were called recusants because they would not sign the legal document. And their situation began to look remarkably similar to mine. Mm -hmm. Parish churches that had been lovingly adorned for generations of the same family were being stripped in front of their eyes of those adornments, turned into whitewashed praying barns. Uh, priests that had been yesterday Orthodox were some of them not so much today. The nunneries and monasteries were being emptied, emptied, many of them getting married. Liturgies that had been in place for centuries were gone and being replaced in many cases by fripperies that had been written yesterday. And I'm not talking about the Novus Ordo. Yeah. You know, and I looked around and said, hmm, this looks familiar. And what those recusants were left with, because the priests had been thrown out of the country, <laughs> were their devotions. Their devotions saw them through and the doctrine of communion of desire. And there I was. <laughs> Well, when I said, hey, how long could this last, you know, <laughs> it lasted just a few years short of a quarter century. Wow. How did I get through that time? Uh, God's grace, that never being separated from him, which is his doing, not mine. I didn't turn my back on him. I didn't, you know, but by the grace of God, he was always there and very close to me. My father's copy of The Key of Heaven from 1940, full of those devotions. I said my litanies. I said my, you know, my novenas. I said my morning and evening prayers. I kept up my Catholic devotional life. And it was only, only but, the but sacraments. But not going to Mass. No, it was, yeah. I was making my communions of desire, yeah. but I was not going to Mass. I had separated myself, and this is the part, there has to be sin attached to it. And when I finally made my life hmm. confession, when I came back, thank you, Jesus, into the full sacramental life of the Church, when the ordinary appears, the whirlwind of sacramental grace being attached again to the conduit of grace as our Lord set it up in the church. By the grace of God, I'd always had the life of the Spirit within me, but boy, it just went like that and has been continuous since. So kids, don't separate yourself from the sacramental life of the church. Yeah. Um, but that went on for 25 years and I've never driven, I don't drive now. Perhaps if I'd been able to widen my search, I would have found a good Catholic parish, but I'll tell you, I didn't find one in those almost 25 years. It was one disappointment after another. Let's not even talk about the Newman House at my university. Okay. I'm wondering if some of the some of the uh, the notable issues that uh, sadly uh, uh, were an embarrassment to the church during the 70s, 80s, and 90s that you could read about in a newspaper were an encouragement to you, or also or confirming that you were right where you thought God wanted you to be. All the way through, because I did do my spiritual homework. I mean, uh, this thing weirded me out right from the start, yeah. but I kept applying to the throne of grace, seeing, as I say, I never got anything but a wholesomeness coming back, as yeah. weird as it was. Yeah. And I guess that would be my, one of the few words I would say is, yeah. God's ways are not ours. And sometimes he can send you some very strange places, as long as you do that spiritual homework, and I mean, really do it, not just say, oh, well, I want to do this, and it seems like it's okay. No, but really, really do it. God's ways are not ours. It's yeah. sort of surprising where he can send you. Sometimes he 
does. We see this in Scripture. We see the lives of the same. Sometimes he does seem to back away or, or put us in situations. Sometimes the test of our faith, how deep is it? How, how loyal are we in the midst of, you read in the Psalms. You know, I think it's Psalm 73 where he, the, the, the writer looks at all the wealthy and all they're doing and how do I know, you know, why are, how do I know they're not right and I'm wrong? And then he said, I looked in the sanctuary, I looked in the tabernacle and I knew where the truth was. So. The other thing which, which kept me up through those days, I mentioned my interest in early music. And, you know, <laughs> the one thing I'll always regret is I never got a copy of the Libre Usualis <laughs> because I missed it by a few years. By the time I was looking, they were all gone. They were in the hands of early musicians. <laughs> the church had just thrown them, thrown them out. And of course, you couldn't hear the great storehouse of beauty that the church had birthed into the world, except in early music concerts. So. Mm -hmm. Those were another species of devotion to me. I would go and sing these gorgeous masses from centuries and centuries of Catholic devotional life. And to me, they were worship. For most of the other people singing the concerts, it was just beautiful music. Yeah. But for me, it was worship. And it was the one place I could get my inheritance as a Catholic at that time. I always knew the church, as I say, would turn around. I never, ever expected to live to see so much of the rebirth that has happened. Mm -hmm. You know, which is, I'm so grateful that that, that has happened. So you, you uh, during that 25 years or so approximately. Only missed it by two. Um, 23 years. Um, you had not stuck your toe in the water of non-Catholic churches. Nope. To explore the possibility. Would, you know, okay. would never think of doing yeah. so. All right. And then, because <laughs> God has a sense of humor and seems to delight in irony particularly, you, you can see it all over the Bible. Right. I, though a musician, I had always had a day job. My father was a very famous voice teacher in Manhattan, and I had seen the, the, the dirty side of the Golden Curtain at the Metropolitan Opera House very early and knew from the time I was this high, I wasn't going that route. So I kept my art over here, and I didn't want to be paying the rent with it. So I always had a day job. And the last one of those was at the Massachusetts Iron Ear Infirmary, of all things, down at the end of Charles Street. And... My office manager was a convent-educated Mexican woman, and I did not know at the time that she was advising me to follow a path she herself had followed 12 years earlier. <laughs> We're sitting there on a Thursday evening in 1990, and uh, she says to me, we talked of little else except the problems and sadnesses of the church, says to me, you ever considered the Church of the Advent? I think you might like it there, says I, Church of the Advent? What is this Church of the Advent? I have never heard of the Church of the Advent. Now, mind you, I've been working for a year about four blocks away from it that way, and I'm living about three blocks away from it that way on Pinckney Street. <laughs> what is this Church of the Advent? So she tells me, I said, well, it's interesting. This was about 6.45. I proceed to walk down Charles Street and look over the Charles River, and there's a steeple over there. So oh, that must be the Church of the Advent. Hmm. God has a sense of humor. It's Maundy Thursday. <laughs> so, hey, I like Peggy. She's got a head on her shoulders. Sure, I'll walk over there, walk through the door, and my hair just about blows backwards. Here is everything I've been looking for for almost 25 years. The beauty of holiness and liturgy and gorgeous Renaissance music, sermons that are orthodox, stimulating to mind and soul. It's everything. It looks just like Catholicism. I mean, this is what's going on here. I got more and more weirded out as the thing went on because this is not only Protestantism, this is Anglicanism. You know, mm -hmm. the people that Thomas More, my favorite saint, his head was given to as a birthday present. And as an Irishman, Irish American, you know, the oppressor of my people, this is too bizarre. What is this Anglo-Catholicism thing? I mean, I'd never heard of the Church of the Advent. Off my radar uh, screen entirely, not a Catholic church. I was gonna say most of the people here too are not familiar with the Church of the Advent. Church of the Advent is, uh, claims to be and bids fair to be perhaps the first Anglo-Catholic church in America. They were founded in the late 1840s, mid 1840s. And you know, Cardinal Newman and his gang only got started 10 years earlier than that. It started in a very weird place because the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts is one of, has always been one of the most liberal dioceses. Yeah. Um, and they've always had their problems with the Episcopal Diocese. But 
it has turned into, by the time Anglo-Catholicism, which is an interesting construct. You know, Cardinal Newman, who got started, many people have trickled straight through and into the Catholic Church. And again, and, for the audience, I mean, Anglo-Catholicism are Anglicans who are very high church, very Catholic in, in liturgy and They ritual. come in all, all flavors, right. but the highest of them, there are actually people called Anglo-Papalists who accept all the doctrines of the Catholic Church, including the primacy of the Pope, mm -hmm. but have decided as long as there's any hope that the entire Anglican communion will come back corporately, they'll stick it out. Yeah. So, and you have everything from there down to the people that just like the, the send the smoke and the, the yeah. bells and such. Um, at any rate, um, they're a very well established community and it is a place I bid fair to say that has, there's a numinous quality about the Church of the Advent. There's something going on there. Hmm. There's, it's, it is quite a holy place. Um, God in his mercy, um, certainly the Spirit, as our Lord said, you know, yeah. goes where he will, does what he will outside the, the walls of the visible church. And I think there's something of that going on at the Church of the Advent. Uh, I certainly found it so there. At any rate, so after that sort of mind-bending Maundy Thursday, I came back for the whole Triduum, and it just kept getting weirder and weirder and weirder. I kept waiting for either Martin Luther or Old Scratch to stick his cloven hoof around one of the columns, like in the fourth act of Faust, but you know, he didn't show <laughs> up. And that's when the cold sweat and the occasional drop of red blood began to perfuse, because of all people in the world, I mean, I'm one of the most traditional Catholics you'll ever meet, and here I was in this weird place. It took a long time for me to get my brain around that, and you can bet there were plenty of prayers over it. But eventually, I found that I could do it, and though I still can't explain it, I came to believe that you know, all of these people, starting with the priest, the rector at that time was a very good one, and that's where I met Jürgen Leas, who's been a guest here, right. and who eventually became the founder of our ordinariate community. Um, the, everyone, starting with the people on the altar, believed in the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, whether they were actually able to confect the Eucharist, that's but another they, matter. But they were all behaving as though yeah. that right there was him who created the entire universe. And personally, though this is only the personal opinion of Kevin McDermott, believing in that doctrine of the communion of desire, I really rather wonder whether our Lord didn't well, give a sacramental grace, but that's not for me to say. Our Lord, the Vatican II recognizes that our Lord is not bound by our laws. By our laws and he is one who desires all to be saved and come to the fullness of the truth. So that's how my odd 20 years as a sojourner within the gates of Anglo-Catholicism. I never became an Episcopalian. I never would become an Episcopalian. I made it clear to everyone there that I was Roman Catholic who was sojourning within their gates. I certainly found it good for me in knocking off a good deal of just sort of mindless tribalism. And I think, if I might say so, that that was true of my Episcopalian and Anglican brethren as well, mm -hmm. who learned that, as I learned, they didn't necessarily have a tail stuck down one trouser leg and cloven hoofs. I think sure. they found that Catholics didn't either. All right. And it taught me that after 500 years of unfortunate separation, it would probably be a lot more what our Lord would desire if we must have a separated, broken body of Christ, if we spent time concerning ourselves with the 90% and more that we all agree on, yeah. and not so much on the 10% well, or less we don't. <laughs> the bust of that pope there in the middle, John Paul, I mean, uh, uh, John the 23rd, that's what he was calling us to, was a focus on what indeed. unites us, and to focus on that, and uh, that pleases our Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. No, there are serious theological and ecclesiological differences, and they shouldn't be wallpapered. But let's appreciate what grace does Absolutely. in the lives of drawing people to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's say, let's pause there. Let's take a break, Kevin, and we'll come back, pick up right from there, okay? Very good. All right, see you in a bit.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is Kevin McDermott. And I've rudely interrupted him in the middle of his Not journey where he's, he's in his Anglo-Catholic phase, which is a fascinating, I was never Anglican at all in my own journey, so I always look from the outside, though Newman and, and Moore and Fisher were important uh, in, in reading their stories and their writings to my own journey. But uh, I think a lot of us uh, who aren't in that, maybe lifelong Catholics or evangelical Protestants don't appreciate the Anglo-Catholic issue. Uh, we may hear about it, but we not appreciate it. And to me, the English Civil War uh, from the mid 1600s really brings the issue to, to the front because the point of that war was the scariness of Anglo-Catholicism for so many Anglicans. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. The, I mean, there were other issues, but King Charles I, the martyr king, Anglo-Catholics consider him to be a martyr. You know, he's basically yeah. a saint. Um, his wife was Henrietta Maria, who was a Catholic. There was a Catholic chapel in the palace. And um, the, one of the things about Anglicanism is it's dependent, in its early days, it was completely dependent on the personal piety of the king because yeah. the king was the head of the church. And in Charles I's time, things were heading back to high church land. Um, and this was at the same time that so many of the colonists were coming to the Americas. The, uh, the Pilgrim Fathers left England because of all of this going on. Yeah. They couldn't live there. They couldn't live with the Anglican church as it was. They came here yeah. to set up the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where I live today. <laughs> right. uh, but they eventually ascended to the throne over there by the simple expedient of cutting Charles I's head off and making him a martyr. He lost his head for a number of reasons, one of which was getting that far away from bringing the English church back into communion with Rome. His Archbishop of Canterbury, Laud, they, fight, they never were really able to get an Anglican church into the Kingdom of Scotland. That was a battle that they never quite succeeded. But it was during Charles I's reign that they finally got a prayer book for Scotland. It was Laud that did it. They sent a copy to the Curia in Rome, and they liked it. They liked it. You know, it, they were that far away, really, to bringing the English church back into communion 100 years after Henry VIII had taken it out of communion. Then the English Civil War happened, and of course, that was the end of that. Archbishop Laud lost his head for one reason and one reason only, putting candlesticks back on the table and putting vestments back on. Oh. That was the end of that. Then there was 15 years of the Roundheads, the, the Puritans that came here to America, being in charge. And it's only Kevin McDermott speaking, but during that 15 years, more damage was done to not only what remained of the Catholic heritage in terms of churches and but more to the Catholic heritage within Anglicanism, the liturgical heritage. By the time the Puritans were done in 15 years, every church in England, from a cathedral to the lowest parish church, had been turned into a whitewashed praying barn. Yeah. They destroyed it. Yeah. And not only that, but the, the, the way Anglicanism was by the time they, the king got back in, it was a very dry and desiccated Anglicanism because of that. This is only me speaking, it's my, yeah. my interpretation, which made the later 17th century, the 18th century, and the early 19th century, that sort of Parson and, you know, Clark, back, 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 back. There wasn't really much blood in Anglicanism through that period, which gives us two things. It gives us Wesley and Methodism, who notice yeah. there's something wrong here, mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit, and suddenly you have this rebirth of an Anglicanism that goes one way, and you get the Oxford divines saying, there's something missing here, I think we threw the baby out with the bathwater, who go back to Sarum and take a different take mm -hmm. on it. And suddenly, you have the rest of the 19th century with two different ways to bring mm -hmm. some of the spirit back into Anglicanism, but I think it really was that, that sharp break of the Commonwealth yeah. that, that sort of killed Anglicanism and, for uh, quite a while. Again, this is Marcus Grodi speaking and not a, a great historian, but it almost seems that the same 
the same uh, fear that led to the English Civil War that took the heads off the king and, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, right, Lot, was the same fear that arose when when Newman put that tract, I forget the number, the, the you know, that it, the, w w everything was fine and fine, and all of a sudden, wait a second, that's too Catholic, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, that was the issue that happened at that same time. Indeed, you know, there's, there are all sorts of things going on here. The, the anti-popery riots in the, in the late 18th century, the late 17th century, the rise of, of Irish people coming in, there's, there are many, many strands here. Um, but, yeah. thank, you know, thank God we, we've come a long way since then. Uh, well, let's, let's back to your journey. I'm sorry, because I, I, this is fascinating stuff. We could, we could talk all day yeah, about English is, history and, and the... But also, uh, it's history to the, the rise of Ang Anglo-Catholics um, who have, have risen in America as well as England and, and other places, uh, partially in reaction against the craziness Mm -hmm. of what's happening morally and theologically uh, in Episcopalianism and, and Anglicanism, but also a yearning for something that's been missing. There's always that. There's always been that yearning. And um, that's one of the things, during this 20-year sojourn amongst Anglo-Catholics, I found much that was admirable, so much that yeah. was admirable, and much that I found was nourishing to my own soul. Um, I think anyone for whom English is their native language, how could you not? Uh, yeah. It's the, the prayer book liturgy is some of the most gorgeous English that's ever been written. And to a certain extent, all of us for whom English is a language, whether we're Catholic, whether we're Anglican or Episcopalian or some other stripe, whether we're not even Christians, we all own it to a certain extent. Any theatrical production, any film you see that has a wedding in it, it's the Anglican wedding, yep. you know, ceremony that's used. Anything that has a funeral in it, the chances are almost 100%. You'll be hearing the burial service. These words are part and parcel of our subconscious. The, the King James Bible, it's, you know, it's part and that. parcel it is. of a, our consciousness yep. as English speakers. Yep. So there, there's all of that. But there's also a certain Anglican way of doing church, not only liturgically and devotionally, but also the, the other parts, how to run a parish, how, how people interact with their clergy. And our bishop in the ordinariate, the American ordinariate, Bishop Lopes, is right on this. He's, he's another, you know, birth Catholic, birth Catholic, but spent a decade deeply immersed in Anglican sources. And I think, like myself, I would call myself, and I hope I am, might be considered worthy to be called an adopted son of the Anglican patrimony. Uh, he says, you know, the, some of the things that are distinctives of this way now brought happily into full communion, grafted back onto the, the church from which it sprang, but in 500 years outside the walls of the visible church, also changed, shaped itself, and is now back in. All that is good in it is back into the church. So that some of the distinctives are the intense biblical nature of Anglican mm -hmm. liturgy. Everything is biblical. It's so intensely, deeply biblical. Uh, the, the way Anglicans uh, do parish life, uh, the, the importance which they have with many other Protestants, uh, which we sadly don't really have, or at least anymore in, in Catholicism, of the importance of hospitality, of fellowship, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the much more equal relationship while still acknowledging that the clergy are the clergy and have special roles. Yeah the importance of the laity, the vestry, that sort of thing. It's a different different kind of hierarchical structure. I found as time went on that there was much that I admired and that I found it spiritually nourishing. I still deeply love my Roman heritage. I, there, you'll find no one who thinks more highly than the traditional Latin mass than I do. You know, I still say my prayers in Latin, but I've found in this another part of myself that I never expected that um, did you experience in Anglo-Catholicism, I mean, we have the, the caricature of the Anglican prelate 
and the Anglican structure in the writings of Trollope and Dickinson, and then Dickens, and, and my favorite writer, uh, Woodhouse. You know, you have this, 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 this caricature of Anglican, the local Anglican curic wanting to, to rise up and become the bishop because of this. But, do you, but, but were you finding in Anglo-Catholicism uh, the awakening of the heart, the conviction to Jesus Christ, not just the surface, but all of it? Well, you've said it. I mean, the, those are caricatures. They're, right. They were written as, as social, social caricatures, social commentary. Uh, if you look at other sources from the same period, and the, the first one I would point you to, just as a wonderful read, is Lark Rise to Candleford, which is a fantastic, don't watch the TV program, please, don't watch the PBS TV program, read the books. Um, it's a wonderful memoir of a childhood in Oxfordshire, only like 20 miles away from Oxford in the 1880s, which might as well have been as far away as New York City to these farm people. It's basically the death of a medieval way of life in cottage farming in England, and it goes through to about 1910. Um, and this really is autobiographical from this woman. Um, in it, you see there are three or four images of what, if you know what you're reading, it's an Anglo-Catholic. An Anglo-Catholic parson comes to town. And what he's doing is the kind of social, it's social work, because that was deeply, deeply ingrained in those early Anglo-Catholic parsons, partly because of that's all they could do. They were so thrown away by their own hierarchy because they were ritualists. The only parishes they could get were the, the poorest and the worst ones. Yeah. That's why they ended up in the East End of London. And what they brought, the, the, the beginning of ritualism, if you will, they brought the beauty of holiness to the worst slums in the world, mm -hmm. in storefront churches, because that's the only beauty those people would see. Mm -hmm. They brought the beauty of God to people that would see no other beauty in the world. But there, there's much to admire in Anglo-Catholicism. So for 20 years you were happy as a bug in a rug? Uh, Except for being weirded out that this, this I didn't even know it existed before, but I found, found a very happy yeah. place. Always yeah. wondered what would happen. When good Pope Benedict erected the ordinariate, I began to have a much better view, perhaps, of what the Holy Spirit might have been up to with all of this. The pastor provision hadn't risen your eyes at all? Um, you know... Which I was really Anglican priests, Episcopal priests, becoming diocesan priests. Absolutely. I was aware of it intellectually, as you know, but perhaps our viewers won't know. There was indeed a pastoral provision from 1997, so seven years after I discovered the Church of the Advent, in, on the south shore of Boston. Right. Now, as I already mentioned, I don't drive, so that might as well have been the moon to me. <laughs> um, so I was north of Boston by that time. And for me, the first inkling that something might be happening was the uh, Anglo-Croam Tretipus. And Jürgen Lies, who's also yeah. been a guest here, at that time had retired from Christ Church Hamilton Wenham, right up in your neck of the woods at right. Gordon Conwell. Right. That uh, congregation had very amicably split, which is an unusual thing at that time. Uh, over the Bishop Gene Robinson issue. They were a very orthodox group, but half of them decided they would remain within the Episcopal communion as a faithful rump, as it were. The other half decided that they could not and went to join the alphabet soup of continuing Anglicanism, ACNA in their case, and found a community called Christ the Redeemer just down the road in Danvers. And uh, my wife and I followed Jürgen Lias to be their first pastor, founding pastor. And that's when Anglicanorum Tretibus okay. came out. So it was there that he said, all right, let's have two sessions, each lasting about nine, nine weeks. Let's look at the history of relationship between the Roman Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church. If there are enough people after that, let's look into the founding of a parish. We did that. Um, and then if 12 people are willing to follow me, we'll found one. And we did. <laughs> so that's how what became St. Gregory the Great was founded. And uh, 
Now, in those sessions, as Jurgen had these mm -hmm. sessions, how, uh, what were the issues that were laid on the table as you nidgen forward? Now, you were a, a, a Catholic in this midst. Right, so I mostly Anxious. kept my mouth shut. Okay, but very happy and anxious Absolutely. the direction you were heading. Tom Howard was the fellow who did most of the most oh. of the talking. Oh, I didn't realize right. that. And he oh, also Tom. was the catechist for God the group that finally did come in. Okay. So that was a wonderful opportunity. The first one was mostly historical, looking at the connection, the, the various attempts to bring organic reunion together. The second one were all the things that you might expect, you know, the primacy of the, the Petrine ministry, what is this about our Blessed Lady? You know, all the things that you yeah. would expect. And because we were up right up there in Gordon Conwell land, uh, all of those communities had a strong leavening of evangelicals who had made their way to liturgical religion in the Anglican communion and then were thinking whether they would go on to Catholicism. So many issues that if it, they'd all been Anglo-Catholics might not have come up were, were dealt with there. But eventually, we, we did, it did happen. Um, the Ordinary for, New, for North America was founded in 2012. Uh, Father Leas was ordained in 2013. Our first mass was said Sunday after Easter, low Sunday in 2013. And um, then, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end here, aren't yep, we? Yep, yep, okay, yep, yep, yep. well, so about eight minutes. We, uh, the first time we had the pleasure of meeting, uh, which you won't remember meeting me, but I certainly remember <laughs> meeting you, was down at the first birthday party for the Ordinariate in February of 2013. And uh, as, a, as a birth Catholic, I mean, I, I see the Ordinariate in a, partic a particular way. Obviously, it has great merit in what it was set up for, which is to bring Anglicans and Episcopalians back into communion, full communion with the church. But as a, as a birth Catholic, I also see it very much as a, a great movement of renewal within the church. Mm. I see in the providences of God many things which belong to the church, but which we have let fall into desuetude, but which were preserved outside the walls of the visible church, being brought back into it on the backs of faithful, faithful people who have a strong conviction, knowing exactly why they are Catholic, really believe in the Petrine ministry and really believe in the magisterium. Now, bringing that back into the church. And most particularly, I see it as a true prophetic act of the Holy Spirit. This is the Reformation. This is the true Reformation, where the action matches what that word means. Hmm. It's separated brethren coming together in the unity that our Lord prayed for on the night before he, he died. You know, it's, it's amazing. Now, some may think that I overspeak myself when at this point it's still a relatively small movement, but I'll tell you, that same Holy Spirit works, has worked a lot more with a lot less, and I believe that those of us who are fortunate enough to be involved in this at this point will be grateful in the way that the first followers of Benedict of Nursia or Francis or uh, Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, all these great movements of renewal in the church. It's hard at the beginning, but I think this is really okay. going somewhere. And the first time I really sort of saw that live and was convicted that this was really amazing, we were down there in Houston in 2013 for the first birthday party. and. I will remember sitting in what is now our cathedral, Our Lady of Walsingham, right. this beautiful English style parish church, and they're doing choral evening song, and there's the verger marching up the center aisle, and there's a choir up there doing beautiful English anthems, and everything is very, very Anglican. But I'm looking up at the front in the in the choir, and there's Archbishop, then Archbishop Muller sitting up there, and several other worthies of the church. And I'm scratching my head thinking, that's the Grand Inquisitor. That's the Grand Inquisitor. Even though they decided a couple of decades ago, maybe we'd better be called the Prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And I'm thinking, there is joy in heaven today. Who could have foreseen this? And then I thought, who might be up there, you know, enjoying it in heaven? And I certainly hope it was Thomas More and Cardinal John Fisher, and I devoutly hope and pray also Cranmer and 
you know, everybody else, a yeah. bunch of Anglican divines. Someone because by the name of Edmund Campion. Absolutely. Yeah. All of them yeah. having flagons of good English ale. Yeah. Because I was put in mind of what Moore said to those who had just judged him to death, which is this. More have I not to say, my lords, but that, like as the blessed apostle St. Paul, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, was present and consented to the death of St. Stephen, and kept their clothes that stoned him to death. And yet be they now both twain holy saints in heaven, and shall continue their friends forever. So I verily trust, and therefore rightly heartily pray, that though your lordships have now here in earth been judges to my condemnation, we may yet hereafter in heaven merrily all meet together to our everlasting salvation. And that's my prayer. <laughs> and that's what the ordinary is about, I believe. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. When I think it was Duffy wrote a book called The Roman Option, I think, um, in which, if, I can't remember the author, but the book was about, we have these Anglicans, Episcopalians wanting to come home and then when, the, when Rome opens the door, they back off. And we see a little bit of the ordinary. You know, we see the, the generosity of, of Pope Benedict. Uh, you know, John Paul was a pastoral provision. Um, we see Benedict opening the ordinariate in response to Episcopalians and Anglicans wanting to come home. When the doors open, we see a holding back. How do we pray for our separated brethren, the Anglicans, Episcopalians? Episcopalians, that they might be open to this open hand to them. Why are they backing off? I can't answer that question. All I can say is that as a birth Catholic, I am still absolutely amazed at the, the generosity, the mercy, the provisions that are in Divine Worship, the Missal, the provisions of Anglicanorum Cetibus. I've never seen anything like it. And, um, I was not around, I was not paying attention. My, my time as a sojourner within the gates was entirely fixated on the parish that I was in. I didn't look to the broader world of the Episcopal Church. I now look back because of where I've ended up. I am trying to do my homework and sort of read into the period of the whole breakup of the Episcopal yeah. denomination. You hear various things. There's this one says this, that one says that. Um, I wasn't there, I can't speak. But all I can say is, it's God, man proposes, God disposes. And his times and his will yeah. is beyond our ken. All I would say to anyone is, pray, pray that hearts be unhardened. When, when I understand the church's move towards uh, recognizing the patrimony of Anglicanism as it's been uh, fairly closely analyzed and, and to make sure that it fits. Um, Everything within. that's good in Anglicanism yeah. has been brought in. So on the one hand, it's a goodness, that it's a gift, but I also see it as what might be seen as a portal of familiarity for evangelization. So we have this portal of familiarity so that those, when they come home, this is home because they recognize Absolutely. A, a bit of that. And we see that even in the use of, of some good Protestant hymns because they're portals of familiarity that uh, lifelong Catholics may not recognize that hymn, but for some they get tears to their eyes because yes, mm -hmm. precious Lord means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, for you was this a portal of familiarity that reminded you though of what you had as a child. The first time I heard the Anglican use the first time I was at the Church of the Advent. I, much of it was unfamiliar to me, but what I heard was Catholicism, serum use Catholicism. Underneath it all, because of my interest in medieval Catholicism, yeah. I saw the bones of the serum rite. Yeah. Things that many Anglicans think is the most Anglican thing in the world, things like the Collect for Purity. Cranmer just translated one of the prayers of preparation from the Sarum Rite. <laughs> and this is for a Catholic. I mean, Trent was in every way as much a modernizing and changing council as Vatican II ever was. The, the entire medieval church pretty much ended up on the cutting room floor. It changed more than, than Vatican II did. But because it happened 500 years ago, a quarter of the time Christianity has existed, people have sort of forgotten that. And they take the Tridentine rite as the, the utter you know, 
that is classical Catholicism? Not so much. But where Trent's right didn't run, you know, like in England, bits of medieval Catholicism stuck. It warms the cockles of my Catholic heart to have Trinity tied. Nobody has Trinity tied except <laughs> us. It's because the Serum calendar never stopped being used in England. Well, we've just opened a whole can of worms <laughs> for a whole bunch of viewers. What are they talking about? Well, we'll have to stop. I have to come back another time. I'd love to, Mark. Kevin, thank you much for joining us on the journey home and sharing your journey. It's with a privilege. Us. God bless you, my friend. And, and thank you for joining us on this episode of the journey home. I do pray that Kevin's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.